Beautiful. All right, T13, display devices. Objectives for this particular session is going to be to describe the different types of displays and their respective characteristics. Describe the purpose of projectors. Uh, describe different setting, settings of monitors and how to adapt them. Identify the video ports and connectors that are utilized to connect monitors and identify common problems that come up with monitors. Teamwork and personal responsibility are going to be our objectives predominantly for this one. And display devices definition, they're typically an output device for visual representation of whatever uh, medium you are trying to use. Uh, it shows what's going on with the program and the operating systems and the video card or display adapter handles all of that communication. Uh, between the CPU and the monitor so that it can come out in a recognizable form. We are grouping most of the things we are talking about into six different types of technologies. Most of these should be relatively familiar uh, from regular usage. You have the old CRT monitors, and then we progressed up to LCD. Then we had LED and plasma. And finally, we are moving into OLEDs, and then we also have in their projectors as well. So first, the CRT monitors or cathode ray tube monitors. These are the old school big box TV monitors that you originally had. They weigh about 600 pounds. They take up a whole lot of real estate on your uh, desktop. You can't even give them away anymore, but they do work for a very long period of time. And um, they typically operate off of a grid of red and green and blue phosphorus in order to give us all the particular colors that we would normally see. Next, we moved into LCD, which stood for liquid crystal display monitors. These were beautiful things. They went from, you know, a monitor taking up the majority of your desktop to taking up very little space. And they, the entire monitor is basically made up of a bunch of little crystals that arrange in rows and columns. And we add a charge to it to align them differently for colors. Currently, they use a thin, film transfer to control each particular dot in that screen. And this allows for a fast refresh in the picture and updating the uh, display. Very, very crisp definitions, much better than you would have on the older CRTs. And there are two basic different types of LCD monitors. Now, if we have somebody in here who is a big gaming or uh, big into gaming and stuff like that, they will tell you right off the bat, they always go towards twisted pneumatic screens because they have the fastest response time and they are brighter, but they also consume a lot more power, but they also have a narrower, narrower field of view. If you remember on the older LCD monitors, if you look at them head on, they look pretty good. If you move off to the side, they get very dark and you can't see them anymore. And then the other type of LCD monitor they have is in-plane switching, which gives you much crisper colors and you have wider viewing angles or you can view it head on, off to the side. You know, so for, you know, televisions in your living room and stuff like that, these are going to be more preferred for those particular uh, types of viewing because it gives you much broader viewing angles where you can actually see it. But they are, they tend to be a little more expensive and they have a slower response time, which, which if you're watching sports and stuff like that, you get that heady blur when objects are moving across the screen. But the key thing you need to remember is if they're talking about LCDs and they mention gaming, your mind should automatically go to twisted pneumatic. That is going to be the preferred 
type of LCD monitor gamers will use. Here is a basic look at the inside of the inside or, or internal workings of an LCD monitor. You have the actual panel itself. Now the panel itself does not produce any light. It just produces, you know, the colors, the different colors. So in order for you to be able to actually discern what's on that screen, they actually have to light it from behind. So they use a backlight behind the monitor to actually illuminate it so you can see what's going on on the other side. First iterations of the LCD monitors used the CCFL, which is the cold cathode fluorescent lamps. They're similar to the long uh, tube lights that you would have in an office building or something like that. They had that distinct buzz or hum to them. And uh, it, the reason they used it was because of low power usage and it had a pretty even distribution of light of light and they lasted a relatively long time because the early LCD monitors, if you remember, were quite expensive when they first came out. Now, the big component that you need to be aware of in here is CCFLs require AC current. So the big problem being, what does the power supply do? What is the main thing the power supply does? Converts to DC. Converts AC to DC, because most of the internal components in the computer require direct current to function. So when you get to the monitor, now you have to operate the backlight. We're now using a power standard that the back that won't function for the backlight of the computer. So they have to use something that's called an inverter to convert it back to AC current so that the lights can actually function. So that's one of the main things inside a monitor is the inverter to convert, the, you know, power supply, AC to DC, inverter DC back to AC so that it can be used. So if you ever hear there's a problem with it, the inverter in a computer, be it a laptop or where, you know, if it's in a laptop, where are you going to look for it? In the monitor. Exactly. So if ever there's an issue with an with a inverter in a laptop, the first place you go is going to be behind the, the actual screen in the monitor. Very good, Amber. Thank you. All right. LED or light emitting diode. It's basically the exact same thing as an LCD, but instead of having the CCFL bulbs behind it, they converted it to a basically a panel of little LED lights to light it up from the back. This was better because it, you know, decreased the amount of energy usage you needed, but unfortunately it increased the cost because the LED lights were more expensive than the CCFL bulbs. But it allowed for a more even distribution of lighting. And the LED does not require the inverter to be there as well because it utilizes direct current power. Also, as a side note, it uses less mercury. So it actually is better to the environment. Mercury is a big issue in the CCFL bulbs as well as the CRT monitors. They have mercury in them as well. Questions so far? All right. Fluorescent versus LED, just a kind of a quick breakdown with regards to size because of the need for the inverter and the thickness of the bulbs themselves, they are thicker and heavier than the LED monitors. The LED monitors tend to be thinner and lighter just because the diodes take up very little space and they don't require the inverter to adjust the power for them. CCFLs, fluorescent bulbs tend to be cheaper, which is a bonus for them. If you don't mind the heavier uh, monitor or TV size, thank, you know, for the most part, we tend to put it where we want it. We leave it there. So this, the actual weight of it is not necessarily a factor we're going to be putting into place. The uh, brightness, unfortunately, on the CCFLs is lower. And 
LEDs can actually be quite bright. The lifespan on the CCFLs is shorter. And then the power usage for fluorescent is higher on the CCFLs versus the LEDs. So you're kind of looking to see, you know, do I want to, you know, what price points are we looking at first? And then based on those price points, you can start looking at the technologies. Obviously, LED for the most part is a superior technology, but there's a cost associated with it. All right. Questions so far? All right. Let me move on to plasma. Plasma displays basically use small little cells of ionized gas, similar to what is used in fluorescent bulbs and or neon lights. Uh, they do offer real high quality crisp pictures with pretty broad viewing angles and offer less blur. Big issue with these, if you've ever experienced it, if you watch, you know, say if you're watching uh, ABC Sports for a long period of time, and every time you turn on your TV, you watch that same program, and then eventually you change it to a different program, and you see the icon down in that bottom right hand part of the screen for ABC is still there because it has the image has burned into the actual TV screen. So if you're watching anything where they'll have like a Chiron on it or bordering uh, with, one, with one of our TVs we had, uh, my wife liked watching older TV shows, which didn't have the widescreen view. They had the old, just square image. And then after a while, we went back and watched something new and you could see the bars on either side of the screen basically burned in because of the image has you know was stayed that way for a very long period of time um they do use them a lot for personal use tvs they can really be planned for like home theater was a really big plasma yeah. purchase for a lot of people back in the day because of the quality of the picture uh minus what kelly's saying uh but the quality is re was really good at the time so it was burning and brightness, I think, was the other issue because the plasmas couldn't get very bright. So if you had a home theater room, it needed to be a quite dark room in order for you to get the full effect from it. If you had it in a very brightly lit room, you wouldn't be able to see the TV very well. So those were the advantages of plasma OLED or organic light emitting diode monitors. These are the ones that are kind of coming up nowadays becoming more and more popular. And thankfully the price point on them is starting to come down a little bit so that they, you know, make a little more sense for people who don't want to spend $20,000 on a TV. And uh, this is kind of the technology of the future. They use the um, layers of organic uh, compounds. They use, they emit their own light, so they do not have the requirement of needing a backlight in order for you to be able to see it. And it still has, even with that, a much higher contrast ratio, like the brights are really bright and the darks are really dark. And if they're really close together, you don't have that where, you know, the light bleeds over into the darker parts of the picture, like you would have with a backlit LED or LCD. Um, and this technology is allowing us to make bendable screens for the most part. They can be warped and bent and giving us options with TVs that were completely unheard of before. Like in the gaming world, you could have, you know, three, you know, pretty well bent screens and almost give yourself almost like you're completely immersed within the game. I believe Diego actually has this set up on his computer. Uh, but the downfall of it is, it is really expensive right now, though the price points are coming down, they still have a ways to go before you're gonna see much wider adoption of the technology. And we're starting to see it inserted into phones 
and all kinds of stuff like that as well. I think they have, um, Android has a folding phone they're coming out with within the next year, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, Scott, those yeah. are, the, the Curve TVs are OLED and that is where they're being, they're able to use that technology is because of OLED, they're allowed to make those curved pictures. And Android has paralyzed. a phone that's foldable as well, Kelly. So you're right about that. For most flagship phones, even the, I mean, even the ones that aren't foldable are OLEDs, and they're almost all made by Samsung. Yeah, yeah they are the leap that the industry leader in this particular uh, area. So right on with that information, Steve. So yeah, this is the newest technology out right now and becoming rapidly the most adopted just because of the capabilities of it and because it's being more widely used. Thankfully, that also means you get economies of scale and the price starts to come down. Lastly, the sixth group that we will talk about are projectors. And they and essentially allow you to throw an image from the device to the wall. And there are two possible ways you can view it. There's the normal view where you have the projector say here by you and you're throwing it to the wall so you can see it. And that is considered a front view, which is the most common. And then they have another type where you can actually have the projector behind the actual screen, projecting everything on there reversed. So it's a rear view projector. You don't typically see those, but they do exist. So you need to be aware of them. So that's the difference between a front view and a rear view for projectors. Some people will do the rear view projectors for home theater because they don't like the brightness of the projector in the room with them because it kind of takes away from the experience. So they will actually box it behind the screen itself and project it to the rear of the screen. All right. Now, the brightness of the projector is measured in lumens, which is essentially the amount of light given off by a light source from a certain angle that can be perceived by the human eye. The greater the lumen, the brighter the projector. Trivia question for anybody in the audience who can tell me what lumens are measured from. What is one lumen? What is the basis for the measurement of it? Can I guess? Do what? I don't know. Somebody know. I just wanted to guess. Go ahead. Guess. Uh, what? Well, how do we, you know, what is the unit of measure? So a lumen, the more lumens, the brighter it is. But how do they figure out what a single lumen is? I'll give you a hint. Mm -hmm. Really mm -hmm. old. Frank got it. In the chat. It was like, it was like they went out at like at night and they put a candle out and it was like how far they could go and still see the candle. Yeah, a single lumen is the equivalent of a light from one candle. So when you see something that's like 8,000 lumens, it'd be like you had to have 8,000 candles in that room to achieve that same brightness. So just a piece of useless information for you. Yes, Scott. So would that be like the same thing, like how, uh, like how they used to do in the 1800s with like the, the oily lamp, like when the illuminate, you know, do you know what I'm talking about? Um, yeah, well, they, they would have the guys that their job essentially was to fill up, it was to light the candles on, on, the, right. on the streets each time. Yeah, but I mean, but around that time, that's how they, they determined to use it as a unit of measure was how much light a single candle would give you right. and then you would use that as a form of comparison to see how bright something was. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Not a problem. So a projector's throw is the size of the image, the size of the image that you can get at a particular distance from the screen. So all projectors, they have a recommended range to which you will get the optimal size and crispness of picture. And so that is called the throw. And internally inside the projectors, you will have the lamps, which is what generates the actual light inside the projector. 
and they tend to put off quite a bit of heat. So projectors tend to have fans to help keep them uh, from overheating, which is another reason why some people with home theater systems will use the rear projector view because that will put the fan in another room. And so the noise from the fan doesn't take away from the experience you're having as well. Also, if you've ever owned a projector and had one of these lamps go out, you'll know that they can sometimes be almost as expensive as the entire unit itself. It is like 80% of the cost of the actual projector is that bulb that you put in there. This is so true. Um, it was a big selling point for warranty at work. Hey, you buy the warranty, you pretty much assured to get your money back once that light goes out it costs X amount of dollars. And they were like, oh, okay, I'll buy it, so. And then quickly they started saying the warranty covers everything but the bulb. <laughs> hey man, I I didn't leave that out, but it covered the bulb. Let me not take that out. It did, it, ours covered the bulb, but we're, I'm not a sleazy sleazy salesman, uh, Kelly. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't make me out to be that guy. <laughs> I would never do that. All right, so monitor settings. The main, uh, we have to get used to the terms that were um, like essentially industry terms, what they mean and being able to understand that. So one of the big things obviously is the brightness to determine, uh, which is determined by the, the backlight of that particular monitor. And it is measured in nits and they can vary somewhere from like 100 to 1000 nits on the uh, on the higher end. So the actual is the perceived brightness. Um, I don't have any uh, trivia on nits. If anybody wants to Google that one, I didn't particularly know that one off the top of my head. I just remembered uh, lumens from something I was doing when I was with the warehouse. I wanted to determine if they actually had a required amount of lighting that you had to have at each area. Like if OSHA had that, and turns out, yeah, they did. And there's a specific lumen measurement that you have to have at every work area for a worker. Because they were saying, I was keeping my work area too dark because I don't like really bright lights. And they were saying it was an OSHA violation. All right, so brightness measured in nits. And then you have the response, right, response rate, <clears throat> which is the amount of time it takes for all of the subpixels in the entire panel to go from pure black to pure white and then back to black again. So it's like the reaction rate for the pixels in the computer. So they can go every, like the entire screen goes from black all the way to white, back to black. And this is measured in milliseconds. And obviously for this, the faster the better. So you are looking for the much like latency, you're looking for the lowest rating possible. And that is different. So response rate is going to be different than your refresh rate, which refers to how often or how quickly your screen can change or update completely from one picture to the next picture. And for I guess most computing, they say 60 Hertz is fine. Um, if you're doing any kind of gaming, you know, that is woefully, you know, under what you need. 90 is okay, but you'll still get a lot of blur. You need, you know, 120 or higher. Okay. Thank you, Emmanuel. Nick. The light from one candle per square meter. I like that. I'm going to add that. To it, gave, it gave it a, um, a boundary. So that really kind of cleaned it up a little bit too. So, you know, okay. I like the it. size component there. And Frankie, Frank put down 144 with the hertz on the, um, the uh, refresh rate. Yeah. And then obviously the higher the refresh rate, the better. So the lower the response rate, the better. The higher the refresh rate, the better. There you go. And that's what that's the take home. That's what we want you to make sure that you know. So good so, job on that one, Kevin. Response rate. Black to white, back to black. As quick as you can. Measured in milliseconds. 
And then refresh rate is that next picture in line, you know, the whole thing bringing up a new picture. And if it doesn't do it very quickly, you get that blur that you'll see, like if you're watching fast moving sports and you have a TV that only has like 90 Hertz or something like that, you'll, you'll have, you'll notice that pretty heavily. And then, um, the last thing you have to worry about is contrast ratio, which is the difference between the darkest part of your screen and the lightest part of your screen. Like we were talking about with the backlit LEDs, sometimes that light from lighting up those sections will bleed over into the dark parts of the screen. So you don't get that real sharp difference between like, you know, the, the light of, you know, of like, uh, like a bright white wall and then looking into a dark room next to it, it would bleed over and you'd get kind of a gray rather than actually having that sharp, crisp black color. So that would be your contrast ratio. And what they say is a good contrast would be 450 to one. So can move from that. And yes, they will ask you questions about these four different measurements uh, with regards to a TV and they will try to trick you on it. The big one is between these two, your response and refresh, to remember the difference between them. All right, different monitor settings, monitor resolution, which is the number of horizontal and vertical pixel, pixels that can be displayed. Most monitors will allow different levels of resolution that you can pick from on your desktop settings. Although typically what you want to select for any monitor when you plug it in, especially initially, is the native resolution, which is going to be the optimal resolution for that particular monitor, you know, what its capabilities are for your screen. Now, here we have the different names for the particular types of resolutions they have and the corresponding resolutions that go with them. So you have the, you know, some of the earliest iterations, which are the VGA, which typically matches up with that blue, uh, looks like the DB9 or DP, DB10 uh, pin. I think some of them are DB15. So you have the VGA. 15. And it has the resolution of 320 by 200. Isn't that great? It allows for 256 colors, and it is based off of analog technology. Then they upgraded a little bit to the Super VGA, gave us a little bit better resolution, but we still were stuck with the same amount of colors. Then you had the XGA. We're kicking up almost into HD, but we're not quite there. The super extended graphics puts us right on that cusp. <clears throat> and then we start getting into modern HD TV, which has the 720p. That was the, you know, the first iterations that came out. UXGA came in a little bit after that, but it was not really widely adopted because everybody was starting to jump onto the HD TV back, you know, um, bandwagon because that seemed to be the absolute way of the future with the new cables. And with those cables, you could transmit sound and picture through the same cable. It was just, it was a better technology. And then uh, we moved into the actual high, high def television, which was the 1080p, which tends to be a baseline for what we will use now. And then at the time of the exam, when it was written, Ultra HD, which is the 4K, that was kind of just starting to come to market, starting to become adapted, starting to, you know, be utilized. Now it is very widely utilized, and we're starting to move into 8K now. Which is crazy. If you uh, if you all have the chance or the time, just right-click on your desktop. If it's Windows 10, I'm sure it works. I think it works with uh, 7, just like that. And go to display and look at your resolution and see which one of these match up with it um i just did mine and mine came up to it's in between w u s g a and 4k but of course i have it hooked up to additional screen which is so much 
less. But if you right click, go to display, you'll be able to see that information about your monitor and what where does it fall amongst the um, ones that we're looking at right now. So Jermaine, you said 4K on yours. Anybody else has one to read out? I think mine is two, uh, 2256 by 1504. Um, I'm reading here, uh, um, it's a Macintosh, uh, the Apple. I hit system preference. Uh, okay. And then um, hit display. Yes, sir. Built-in built display, 15.4 inch. Intel HD graphics, uh, 630, 1536 uh, megabytes graphics. I don't know if I'm reading that correctly. 1080p for um, Chris. Uh, Kelly, help out William. I don't know where to go on Mac to pull up that resolution. Okay. Somebody else using Mac. Is it Frank or a DJ? One, I think it's DJ. Uh, I don't know where to pull it up on the Macs. Uh, 1080. Uh, settings and then go to displays. Let's see what it says, William. Just it, now you see these numbers. Now you can kind of put it to a real life situation. Like, you know, for the longest, we will see all these numbers. But it's cool that 1080p HDTV 1080p is really 1920 by 1080. Like, to know that that's where that 1080p came from and that 720p came from. That's kind of now you can put put you know put a name or a number with a uh, action. So Amber, what does what does yours say, Amber? No, what I'm looking for. Okay. I went to display, but if you go to display, you and you go you roll down a little bit, it'll tell you your resolution for your monitor, and it, it should come up with the by some number by some number. Oh, okay, I didn't see that. And it says, that number would, would yeah, represent what you see here. 1920 by 1080. So you're 1080p. That's your that's the, the quality of your monitor right now in its native state. So that's all I was getting at. You have the ability to see that now. A lot of the older left. Go ahead, I can hear you. What happens if you change it? Because that's what's that's what it's on as recommended, but it's like different. Okay, if you go. If you, that's the native, that's where it wants to be. But right. if you send that number up higher, you'll notice that the the items on your desktop will become smaller and, okay. and try to be more defined. But sometimes you can lose a little quality there too. But if you go down, they it gets a lot bigger and probably also looks a little fuzzy. For people who, who aren't able to probably see, that's another option they can do to increase the... Uh, those those uh, applications are those, are those folders. So, but it lands where it wants to be in its most ideal situation. So, 1080p okay. is for you for sure. Thank you. Uh, I have a Chromebook. Um, mine says uh, something a little different. I hope I looked at the right one, but I don't know if everyone saw it in we, the chat. But uh, yeah, 1366 to 678, and those right. numbers represent horizontal versus vertical crave my wrong kelly no that's correct so it, that 768 that can vary this thing is is like you're looking at the you know the minimum standards here so yeah that, that 768 could also be the size of the way that your screen is on your chromebook too because that month if you have like a, a ultra wide uh uh a wider screen, it, that not just your normal 15 inch, if it's like 14 by something, or if it's 20 by something, those numbers can suddenly change up or down, but but it'll fall within the right range. But that's a, that's a good number as well. I remember when it was 800 by 600. That's what I'm trying to get back to you when the, the CRTs was pumping out 800 by 600 or something lower than that. So we've come a long way. It's, at the end, that, that's the bit, the, the root of what I was trying to get to. We've come a long way. That is true. It's true. All right. Other settings kind of just be aware of. You have your aspect ratio, which is the ratio between the horizontal and the vertical pixels. The most common ratio is four to three or uh, 16 by nine or 16 by 10. 
And then it breaks down the common resolution ratios for that, the 640 by 480, and then 416 by nine, you start seeing the 1600 by 900, 366 by 768, I think it's the one you just mentioned there, Scott. So that is a 16 by nine ratio, aspect ratio. And then what we were just talking about was the native resolution, which is the optimal resolution for the particular device that you have. It will communicate with your computer and basically tell it like, hey, I function best here. And oftentimes the computer will just go ahead and set resolution to that, makes that life a little bit easier for the rest of us. And um, LCDs can't typically run at a resolution higher than their native one. And they basically, like we just said, tell the, tell the computer, hey, here's what I can run at. And the computer will more often than not comply with that. All right, multiple displays. Uh, who was talking? Yep, okay. So multiple displays. So most PCs will allow you to use multiple monitors as long as uh, there is a display card installed in each. And multiple displays, you can basically do them one of two ways where you have a mirror desktop, which is great for like presentations and things like that, where what's, what is shown on one monitor is shown exactly on the other monitor. So they're basically just a mirror of each other. But more often than not, the way people will utilize them nowadays is an extended display where your one uh, desktop seamlessly you know, merges into the other screens and it gives you much more real estate to operate from on a daily basis. Um, I think, you know, like when I first started working in logistics, everybody had one screen and then it quickly jumped up to two and then three. And then um, I think some of the places actually, they started working from four. Uh, Jermaine, I think he said he had 15 screens he was operating off of. He's got like five layers of it going up. It's like a wall and he just kind of uses that to uh, have all of his assignments up and play video games at the same time. So it is beneficial to create that additional uh, real estate. When you start working with multiple monitors, it is really, really difficult to go back down to a single monitor if you do that for any length of time. <laughs> Gotta feed the ADD. I like it. But yeah, this is multi monitor setups are now quickly becoming the norm rather than the exception. So, monitor settings, privacy filters. This will come up again in security. Um, if you work anywhere where you're dealing with personally identifiable information, for people, any kind of proprietary stuff for your company, things like that, they may have a requirement that you absolutely must have a privacy filter on your screen. It helps prevent what is called shoulder surfing, where people can kind of just look off to the side or look over your shoulder and pick up on the information that you have going on on your screen. Beauty part of the twisted pneumatic LCD screens or LED screens, it's built in because when you get off angle, they start to, you know, black out anyway. You have to have a straight on view for them to actually function properly. All right, and anti-glare filters. A lot of times they can be the same thing. So, you know, if you've ever worked somewhere where you had windows behind you and then, you know, sometime around three o'clock, all of a sudden you have the sun directly behind you on that monitor, you won't be able to see anything. So you would typically use something like an anti-glare to kind of prevent that from happening. Also, fluorescent lights from the top, shining on it can be kind of, the glare can be really distracting or annoying, and this helps minimize or negate that. All right, questions so far? All right. Quick little quiz for everyone. And stop share on this one. We're 
all those connected in Nearpod, you can go ahead and look on your screens. You should be able to see it. So what is the response rate? So we had to figure out what the difference was between response and refresh. And as we talked about, it's how fast the pixel can change from one color to another. Can it go from blue to green or, or blue to yellow, or blue to red? You know, how fast can it change between these particular colors? Two, refresh rate, which were the, the two main ones we got to remember the difference between is the number of times per second that the display device can bring up a whole new image. And then uh, what is the resolution of HD? Is the 1920 by 1080. We knew the 1080 was in there. So these could possibly get you but it was the 1920 by 1080. And again, it's probably the first time some of you guys have seen some of the, the specs. And what is the response rate? How fast a pixel can change from one color to another? We already did this, all right. So, not too bad. The ones you just wanna keep reviewing for yourself just so you can Keep them fresh in your mind Refon response versus refresh those are the two main ones that will trick you up the others tend to be relatively self-explanatory um this is a review of the display modules we kind of went over a couple slides ago and the different types of connectors that we will utilize to hook up monitors to our computers and or whatever device we're trying to display from. So you have your VGA, DVI, HDMI, and so on and so forth all the way down. You're gonna to wanna to be able to identify a lot of these on site and tell whether or not they are analog or digital. All right, one of the oldest we have is the 15 pin VGA port also called a DV15. That offers the lowest resolution and it is basically the standard analog port and transmits in three particular signals, red, green, and blue, and blends these particular colors in order to give us the 256 different colors that you will be able to see with the VGA. And Definitely with this one, we want to remember it is analog. Analog is the older technology moving into digital. Now, DVI or digital visual interface, if you ever use these, they um, are the white connector ends that you will use on monitors. They were kind of a bridging technology between the analog interfaces and the digital interfaces. It is the only technology that does both. So the key thing to remember, and you actually will want to try to memorize these pinouts. They're not, it's not that bad typically, if it just has the one slash that is digital only. Um, and then if you have a slash with a couple bars and then there's a bunch of pins missing, analog only. And then these two, if you have the slash with four blocks and everything's filled in, that is dual link. And then you have the DVI single link here, which is either digital or analog. And it is not, it is a either, it is not a both. 
You cannot have digital on one end and analog on the other. It will not convert from one to the other. It just means that this particular cable is able to handle either digital transmission or analog transmission. You could use it either way. But they did have EVIs that only did digital and ones that only did analog and then both. And then you, so you wanna remember this based on the acronyms. I is the uh, both. D for digital and DVI-A for analog. So A analog, D digital, I both. Questions on that? So if I had a CRT analog monitor and I had a digital output on my computer, which one of these cables would I use? Can, uh, can you repeat that? So if I had a digital output mm -hmm. and an analog input, like an old CRT monitor, which one of these cables would I use? The DVI, oh, right? right? The DVII. Okay. No link. I would say A. Okay. No, no. I would say D. Okay, digital. So we have one for both, one for digital. It's actually a trick question. Because Remember what I was saying, you would have to have, it would need to be the same on both ends. It would need to be a digital send and a digital receive or an analog send and an analog receive for that DVI I to work. Because the cable itself does not convert a digital signal to an analog signal. So no matter what you do, you would have to have the same type of sending and receiving capability on either end. Now, if I had an analog on both ends, which cable would I use? A, DVIA. Is that it? Agree, DVIA. Okay, can I, is there any other one I can use? Yes. There you go. So that's the difference is that that cable in the middle can go either way. You can use it either way. It just can't convert. That's all it is. It's a, it, it is a bridge technology. When we were converting over from analog to digital, this one just kind of bridged that gap of those two technologies. So any questions with regards to DVI cables? Don't have chat up, hold on. All right. HDMI, this should be one that uh, most of us are familiar with, with most TVs, uh, any kind of home theater or anything you have typically uses this particular type of cable for the overwhelming most part. And the beautiful part about this was it allowed both digital and audio or video and audio at the same time to be transmitted over a single cable. It did not require multiple cables to actually have this data transmitted. So that was huge in the uh, home theater and display technologies. Um, there are several types of HDMI cables. Quality, you know, definitely matters when it comes to HDMI cables. 
we had a lady in our previous class who uh, had disagreement with her husband where that cost actually matters. You know, it depends on the cables a lot. And he was just like, a cable's a cable's a cable. It all does the same thing. It doesn't matter. They're just trying to get more money out of us. Not the case. They will allow for much faster throughputs and much, you know, much better data transmission depending on the type of cable you get within the HDMI family. So being able to read the specs on the back, understand what your needs are and what uh, your devices can actually handle. Because if you're trying to upgrade to 8K, you buy an 8K, uh, like, DVD or Blu-ray player, and then you have an 8K TV, but you only have a 1080p uh, HDMI cable, what are you going to get? Basically create a huge bottleneck where the data can't go through as good, and you will only have basic high-def pictures. Uh, the most common type of HDMI you would see is the normal type A, which is the 19 pin right here. Though we're starting to see used more frequently is the smaller type C HDMI mini connector. It looks exactly like the other one, just a smaller version of it. Still contains 19 pins, much like its big brother but it is in a much smaller form factor. So it does not take up as much real estate inside the computer or with cables. The um, maximum length that you're allowed to have really depends on the cable. And some people think this doesn't matter, but it actually does. The longer the cables, the more distortion you will have with data in the lines and the quality. And this is with, any cable, which is why they'll say like a USB cable can only be three meters. Uh, one of the ones you'll come across is a network cable, a Cat6. You know, its maximum length is 100 meters. That's that's it. Once you exceed 100 meters, your data and your data starts to degrade really quickly. So you actually have to utilize something. If you want to go further than 100 meters, you would have to re-up that signal so that it can continue on. The same thing's happening here with HDMI cables. The quality of that cable will really determine how long that cable can actually be. And the longer the cable is, the more distortion in the data or degradation you will see. Yes, Scott. Yes, I, I'm sorry, I just have a quick question. Um, I don't know if it's a contradiction. Um, because the type C, I noticed it says 19 pins, but we were talking about USB connectors recently, and I, I know that there's another Type C that we use for our cell phones, and it has 24 pins. And that I is see a USB Type C. This is an HDMI Type C. Different shape, different form factor. Oh, okay. So there's two different kinds. So if you look at you know if you look at this one right here on the screen, you can mm -hmm. see it, it almost looks like you know. The DVI or the uh, DV15 ports where it's got, you know, it's a rhombus shape where it's like longer on one side, shorter on the other, and then it's connected, you know, by these two angles on the side. See that? Right. So, and then you have the same exact form factor happening on the mini HDMI right here. We have the bottom parts longer, the top parts shorter, and then it's angled down in between. And then if we look at the USB type C, my absolute horrible drawing skills here. <laughs> it's just an oval like that that can be reversed. So you would not be able to use a USB Type C in an HB HDMI Type C port. They wouldn't fit. They wouldn't work. Right. So it's different okay. uh, different types of connectors. Oh man, because you know with the same name threw me off for a second. <laughs> well, the Type C is the same, and C is typically referring to the generation. You know, like when you see USB 1 and USB 2, that's typically referring to the generation of that particular uh, technology. USB A, USB B, USB Type C, like like Kelly said, it's, it's a generational thing as well. Well, A, B, yeah, and A, B, and C would be the different footprints within USB as well. So, I mean, so you have A, B, and C and USBs, which is the footprint, what it looks like on the outside. And then you have 1, 2, and 3, which is the generation. 
HDMI cables use the A, B, and C for the generation. Oh. All right. That, uh, I suppose Unfortunately, it's... that's just something we're going to have to memorize. Right. So there's no real trick to it. It's just kind of rote memorization of that one, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you, sirs. Not a problem. My eraser here. There we go. Really hoping to try to get this one done before lunch, but I may not make it. Uh, display port was designed to be the replacement for the DVI with monitors. And it transmits strictly in digital, not analog like um, DVIs are capable of. Um, uses the packet transmission method used, you know, typically or very similar to what is used on a Ethernet, USB, or PCIe, um, bringing some uniformity to the medium. And regular display ports, they're used on video cards, desktops, computers, and stuff like that. You're starting to see them become out more and more and more as it is becoming quickly the industry standard. If you look at it, it almost looks like an HDMI, where it has like one side is uh, longer than the other on the on the top and bottom of it, but one side is cut off flat, almost like a USB, and then you have an angled piece on the other. If you see what I'm talking about, so that's how you would be able to visually identify a display port based on the cable. And maximum length you would want to go on a display port is around 15 meters or roughly 45 feet. After that, signal starts to degrade, picture is not as crisp, and the drop off is pretty quick. All right, Thunderbolt. I believe this one was actually co-produced by Apple, uh, combines the PCIe Express and the display port into a single serial signal, and also plot, um, provides power all in a single cable. It's a very, very powerful cable. This one is starting to quickly gain popularity as well, um, can transmit video or data as easily. Shorter cable lengths that are allowed, about three meters or nine feet. And they can achieve up to, man, about 20 gigabits per second, which is really fast, and uses the same connector as a mini display port. Thunderbolt 3 uses a USB Type C, which is one of the fat with the rapidly um, growing and adopted technologies currently and can reach up to 40 gigabits per second. Uh, typically being used by the Apple family, Mac Pro, MacBook Pro, and MacBook Air right now. Though, depending, they may expand because it is a pretty powerful technology right now, but it all depends on other computer manufacturers, whether or not they're going to upgrade. Questions so far? All right, we're going to go ahead and pause the recording. Go. You could continue the recording, please, sir. You're good. All right, moving back on to the next slide. All right, next particular type of or video connector you will see would be the composite video, composite. Typically it is three pronged, usually sometimes you hear them called RCA cables and they would have your video, which is your yellow connector and then your left and right audio. <clears throat> so this was a technology just above coax, allowing for a little bit better um, image clarity 
and to be able to you know start moving closer and closer towards that hd we know today um, also there was a technology called s video out which is this one right here it looks similar to the ps2 connectors that you would see for keyboard and mouse this technology was pretty brief it was not around very long it was there not heavily adopted not overly used they typically stuck with the rca or they moved on to the next level up beyond that and uh any questions with these so with our with composite video you have the left and right audio which is the white and red and then the video and it blends the red green and blue together into a single signal questions so far. All right. Now, much like the um, refresh rate and uh, was it reaction rate on TVs, the confusion in connectors tends to come with composite and component video. Component video, rather than using the three, actually use five connectors. You have the left and right audio, red and white, and then they had the red, green, and blue broken out into separate signals. And this got us up to on the cusp of HD video, it gave much better clarity. Um, these, these were like the high def standards, highest definition standards you could get for a while. Um, so you would see it a lot in uh, home theater systems and things like that. Then they moved on beyond this. Here's the S video we just talked about, which is the bridging technology that didn't really take off. It's a six pin connector. <coughs> and older video cameras like uh, camcorders, like big bulky ones would use this and also called a mini DIN, D-I-N, mini DIN. Again, not widely adopted. It looks similar to the PS2 connectors, but was not fully adopted by the marketplace. Then we have the one that's pretty familiar to pretty much everyone, which is the coaxial cable and the coaxial cable not only for video also wonderful for data anybody who has a cable modem will know this and there are two main types of connectors that you will typically see on a coaxial cable the one that they will always ask about is the BNC, which is this one right here. These two connectors together are called the BNC. One has barbs that stick out that are teed out and it will fit into the uh, mail piece and then it will twist and lock in place. It offers a very, very secure connection and um, can quickly be released if need be. This is typically when you would have the uh, bus Networks initially in offices, they operated off of coax using BNC connectors. And so you would see this more in an enterprise environment, not typically in a home environment. In a home environment, as we're not going to be disconnecting and connecting these things frequently, you would use the other type of connector, which is the one many of you will be familiar with, which has the threaded uh, screw on the end of it when you stick it in and then you twist it all the way in and it locks it firmly in place and keeps it there because you're not going to move it that often that is called an f type connector f as in frank or foxtrot however you want to see it that is the other type of connector you will see with a coaxial cable so b and c which is bayonet neil councilman although there is some argument as to whether or not that is the actual name for it but these are the three gentlemen who um, developed 
the connector. So that is the assumption, which has the two part connector that goes in and twists. And then the F type, which is the threaded screw. Questions so far? All right. Now, many times we're going to connect something, especially when technology is starting to evolve. If you get a, the newest, latest and greatest computer or something along those lines, and you have a older piece of technology that is still quite useful that you don't quite want to give up yet because it serves its purpose. It does what it needs to do very well. And you just can't bring yourself to get rid of it. There are technologies that can bridge it. We use adapters or converters. Now, the most common ones listed below, we have DVI to HDMI. So the DVI signal would go to here. What types of DVI would we be able to use with this particular converter, do you think? VGA? No, DVI. Oh, excuse me. What, what types of DVA or DVI connectors could we use with an HDMI cable? A digital one? DVID. DVID, is that it? Is that it? The one with both audio and video. Well, DVI doesn't do audio and video. It just does video. Oh no, I'm sorry, that looked like DVI-I. There you go, DVI-I. So you do DVI-D or DVI-I, and that would be an adapter. Now, HDMI to VGA, would you consider that an adapter or a converter? Converter. Very good, why? Um, because it's a, uh, well, the VGA connector, uh, it, it has a little, uh, it's using the HDMI cord to connect to the, to the device, whether it be the, the computer or the laptop. Okay, but right? this, one is a, this one is a DVI to HDMI, and we would consider that an adapter. Why would we consider HDMI to VGA a converter? It What's use, it doing differently? It can use the same cord, just different. Uh, connectors. Well, that's what no, no, the adapter no. does the same thing. You're converting from a digital signal to an analog. Excellent. Thank or the you. other way, which. And also You're another welcome. thing to note is that there is that most of those are directional, so you can only go one way. Correct. Correct. So the reason it is a converter it is it is changing the signal from digital to analog. Thunderbolt to HDMI, that would be a adapter. Uh, display port to DVI, typically also an adapter. And HDMI to display port, also an adapter. So you have the display port to DVI right here. And then you have the HDMI here, the display port here. Questions so far on adapters and converters? All right. All right, video cards. Also called uh, graphics adapter cards or display cards. Um, typically you have one built in and it's already integrated though it is not necessarily going to be exceptionally high quality if you're going to require much more computational power or heavier graphics uh, rendering. You're gonna need something a little more uh, robust to take care of that for you. Um, a lot of this stuff will allow you to be able to use multiple monitors, um, either in a mirroring or extended desktop capacity. And um, oftentimes your video cards are going to go into your PCIe slots. Though on some of the older machines, you will use the AGPs, which are what color on the motherboard? 
Anybody? When we're looking at the motherboard, how can we identify it's it? Yellow. It's brown. Brown. Excellent. And what does AGP stand for? Advanced. Thanks. Accelerated graphic port. There you go. All right. Obviously, the fastest one you would want to use PCIe. Uh, at time by 16 at slot, that is going to be your fastest throughput going through the North Bridge into the CPU. The At the time of this, the top manufacturers for graphics cards were NVIDIA and ATI. Here is a look at an older video card, obviously. Uh, most of them would have a case on them nowadays and little bit beefier build, but as you can see, when you're kind of looking down on it, it looks almost like a miniature version of the motherboard. Here's where your GPU is going to be located. It's going to have the fan and heat sink on top of it. It has its own built-in um, RAM. It has a uh, it, multiple inputs and outputs, typically. It has its own on-site RAM. It has its own cache memory, everything kind of built in. And then it utilizes that while it's attached to the uh, motherboard. So best way to, that I've always found to, you know, view the actual graphics card itself is like essentially a mini motherboard with its own CPU attached, which they call the GPU. All right. Real quick activity, recognizing the different types of cables we have. Let's see who wants to go first. Let's see, number one, Carlos. Amber. Yep. You what do you got? To come on out mute. Mm. What it look what what does that look like on top of it? It's a letter up there. You always ask me to see stuff. I'm learn. I can't see that. Um what if I told you it was a D? D V. Wait. Mm -hmm. Someone help out Amber. Amber, help, call somebody. Tag, tag a friend in. Um, Mogus. I see it. Okay, yeah, it's display. Manuel already answered it. Yeah, Emmanuel said it in the chat. That is display port. Um, let's see. So that's number one. So number two. Let's see if you're on your A game, Emmanuel. What's number two? Be specific. DVID. DVID. Looks like it. I know it has the line in the middle, but I don't think it has anything on the top or the bottom. So yeah. we know it's not A. We know it's not. All right, I think it is D. I think it's D, Kelly. Mm -hmm. Good job, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, pick somebody to do number three. Avery. Avery's a little under the weather. Hopefully, he'll be able to respond in chat. Avery, what's number three, sir? Do we agree? Yeah, 
Anybody want to help out with Avery? Avery, put USB in the chat. Is it a Thunderbolt? Ashton's on it. Good job, Ashton. And the, the also just to kind of piggyback off of it, you're not going to be running too much, too much of a display through a USB, Avery. Well, USB C, you could. C. But that, yeah, with that's that's not C. But no, yes, you're right, right uh, Kelly. But a C, you could. All right, number four. Let's go with Chris. Um, is it a DVI? A? No. Count your pins up in there, Chris. Uh, Right here. That's like 12. That kind of yeah. Oh, VGA. Thank you, Moses. There you go. VGA. VGA. What's the other term we would use for VGA? Anybody? What else would we call it? DE15. DB15. Very good. I hear you, Will. <laughs> Outdated. That's funny. You may, uh, Will, you had your hand up for a second too, didn't you? Yeah, no, I just, um, I, I thought, uh, I was going to say, uh, I was going to answer for, for Chris. So I was ready to answer if anything. All um, right. Well, I'm Mike, good, good. since you're here, what's number five? Oh, number, uh, <laughs> 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 number, number five is coaxial uh, for the cable. Coaxial, am I pronouncing it right? Co yeah, coaxial. Coaxial. Okay. coaxial. And, yes. What kind of fancy connector do we have on there? Um, yeah. I'm not going to look at the chat. Hold on. SPDIF? S-PDIF? We talked about two. We talked about type F and BNC. Which one do you think that is? All right, I'm gonna go with uh, what Mr. Mogus is saying, uh, F-type. Now the F-type is what you would normally see at your home when you hook cable up. That's the type that you physically put into the device and screw it in. B and C is gonna be the answer and it's the type that you push in and then turn and lock it in place. Right, right. I, I briefly missed that part. I remember you got, we just, just finished going so, through that. Okay. So we'll okay. Mo more likely, we're, we're used to saying F type, but that one is B and C. What is it? Bayonet Neil connector? What is it called? Bayonet Kelly? Neil Councilman. Neil, okay. B and C coax. Good job with the coax, though, William. But that, that you'll know, you now know that's that B and C. And Amber, yeah. Amber's going to take us home, right, Amber? Um, I want to say HDMI. And you would be correct. I want to say you're right. <laughs> Good job. So the more I think about it, I'm starting to think I'm kind of like an impressionist painter. You know, impressionist painters will kind of use a lot of blurry images and you stand back and it actually looks like an actual piece of scenery. I'm thinking I do the same thing, but with writing. It's a bunch of random squiggles, but at some point it might give you the impression that it's actual words. It's, it's unique to say the least, Kelly. <laughs> All right. Good job, everyone. All right. Troubleshooting common monitor issues. Typical things that you might come across are ghosting, streaking, fuzzy vertical edges, monitor not showing any red, 
bad pixel. Pixel stuck on pure white. Dead pixels, another one. Flickering images, dim images, and a hissing noise. So, these are the typical, the common things that you would see. Um, ghosting, which I believe it's where you see like two images kind of laying on top of each other. So like instead of seeing a single person, you'll see a person and then a ghost image of them kind of off to the side of it. Uh, streaking, where you have the lines moving through the actual picture or the fuzzy vertical edges on the pictures. Typically, that's going to point you to an actual cable as being the problem or your connection itself is not firmly in place. So you want to be sure to go up and check your cables. And regardless of what the person tells you when you are stepping up to someone's workstation, if you are physically on site, and if, it, if it's an issue having to do with internet, one of the first things you want to check, check the cables. If it's an issue with the monitor, regardless of what they said, they might have said they checked it a dozen times, check the cables. And always remember, cables have two ends. So you check the one on the monitor and you check the one attached to the computer itself. And if worse comes to worse, if it's one of these things, ghosting, streaking, or fuzzing, it may be a damaged cable. The cable might have a broken pin. The cable might have uh, a short in somewhere in the cable and it's just not giving you a good image. Try swapping out that cable. And a lot of times that'll fix your problems. Uh, a single missing color. Again, that comes down to cables. There might be a break in the cable, bent points, bent pins, not fully secure. Uh, if it's not one of these particular things, it's probably an internal issue on the monitor and likely that is going to be a field swappable device most of the time. And you will send that monitor back and collect a new one or just swap it out if you have extras on site. Uh, bad pixels. LCDs are notorious for this. Um, if they're out under warranty, you might be able to get them replaced. Um, the three different things you have is you have a dead pixel, which is one that never lights up. You have a stuck pixel, which it's lit on a particular color. It could be blue, green, red, what have you. Or um, a lit pixel, which is it's just always on and it's white. Now, if it's stuck pixels, sometimes you can actually do a restart on the monitor and it will fix it. It will kind of refresh itself and correct that particular issue. Um, same thing can possibly happen for a stuck pixel. Does anybody know what you do if you have dead pixels? There's two things you can do. What are the two things you can do if you have a dead pixel on your uh, LCD monitor? One of them's up here, tells you. No, not Monitor. yet, Avery. <laughs> throw it <laughs> away. Throw it away just yet. <laughs> we recycle. Um, no, so if you have dead pixels, one of the options is to change the monitor out. What's the second thing you can do? Could you check the cables? Check the cables, come back, still have dead pixels. Could you change the screen? Video card. Video card, you might try that. But typically, dead pixels is pointing to a hardware issue within the monitor itself. Change the screen? Huh? Change the screen? Change, well, we said that was one. One, way, one thing you can do is change out the monitor. What's the other thing you can do? These would be the op these would be the these would be the options you would give uh, a supervisor or whoever's holding the checkbook with regards to the monitors, like whoever's doing equipment purchases. So, all right. One thing you can do is change out the monitor. The other thing is deal with it. Essentially, it's not something that can really be fixed. If it's only a couple pixels here and there, it may not bother you. You just right. kind of feel it. And typically warranty will only cover it if it's X amount of pixels per square inch that are yes. actually dead. That's exactly true, uh, Kelly. That was the warranty that we had at work, but 
with radiologists, if there are dead pixels, that warranty will come into play readily, uh, pretty quickly. And oh, anybody know how much that monitor costs? I I shudder at the thought. It's it's Probably five digits. Five digits? Okay. Wow. I think the last one we purchased was about sixteen thousand dollars. Because I imagine it needs to be extremely high definition and uh, about as crystal clear a picture you can get. Yep, and they will complain that one pixel. They will complain. They're saying that they won't be able to diagnose or rule out something. They're going to make a fuss about it. So seventeen thousand dollar purchase. And they'll have you on there next business day if anything goes wrong. Well, I mean, think about it on the flip side. You know, if you're a patient and you're going in, do you want a doctor trying to review, you know, a, you know, a, a X-ray of you on a screen CT, with a bunch of you're right. Pixels? You're, you're exactly mean, right. You're exactly right. And I think that's I the mean, thought process there too. So. From a patient perspective, I want them to have as crystal clear a view as they possibly can to be able to catch whatever might be wrong. <laughs> So yeah, dead pixels, you know, in a typical office environment, we're only dealing with like spreadsheets, you know, a couple word documents, you're keeping up with some basic forms. It's really not going to bother me if they have like 15 or 20 dead pixels in the screen. So at that point, you would kind of say, yeah, we can deal with it. But as Marvin was talking about, you know, if you're dealing with something where the clarity of the image is paramount to you being able to successfully do your job then 15 or 20 dead pixels might actually be a major issue for you. So it all depends on what it's being used for and what your tolerance is with regards to damage. Right. All right. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. Carlos, can you please read for us? All right, common monitor problems. A flickering image with an LCD usually points to either a very inexpensive panel with too much light bleed from the backlight or a dying CCFL backlight. LEDs don't flicker. Replace backlight if necessary. A dim image, especially on only the top or bottom half of the screen, points to a dead or dying backlight in a multi backlight system, if LCD makes a distinct hissing noise, an inverter is about to fail. It can be changed if needed. Excellent, thank you. All great points, things you want to definitely remember. Um, LEDs don't flicker. That's something you want to definitely commit to memory. They do not flicker. They are either on or off, that, that's it. So if you do start to see some flickering, it should indicate immediately that it is a CCFL backlight. And much like the office lightings that you would have or in school or whatever, those big long fluorescent bulbs, when those things start getting old, they start flickering a lot and getting, you know, making a really annoying noise. It is very distinct. You will remember it. And uh, it's just, you're getting towards the end of that life cycle. You can open it up, swap out those CCFLs if you want or we're just replace the monitor as monitors, you know, low on the lower end are pretty cheap and inexpensive to swap out. So it will become a time value of money issue. Um, the money you're gonna pay a technician to take that monitor apart and replace that bulb versus just swapping it out for a new unit. It's whatever's gonna be uh, most, or the least expensive option for you at that time. If you have on-site techs, would you rather have them working on that? or making sure the servers are up and running. So it's where do you wanna put your efforts? Uh, dim image, uh, especially with LED panels, like if it's only on half of it, some LED panels where it would have four different sections, some have six, eight, and so on. Some of them go down to the individual LED and they'll have like 50 of them back there. But originally it was all of them on or all of them off or they did regions. So if it's like the top half, it could be the top LED panel going bad, or it could be a CCFL is dying and needs to be replaced. So you could go in and just replace one bulb. But again, do that 
cost analysis to see if it's actually worthwhile for you to do something like that. If you have a tech making, you know, 80 bucks an hour, are you going to have them spend four hours working on a um, monitor to replace a CCFL bulb when you could buy a new monitor for like 80 bucks? Probably not. Um, the distinct hissing noise. Yeah, typically you hear that one time and you won't forget it. It's kind of like when you hear, if you hear that grinding noise in a um, mechanical hard drive, if you hear that grinding noise, that basically is the, the death cry of a mechanical hard drive. You will hear that one time and you will never forget that sound. Because at that point, if the person has not backed up their data, the only thing you can do is offer condolences. That's it. I mean, that drive is toast at that point when you hear that particular sound. So, questions so far on common monitor problems. All right, I believe we have a quick match. Pause the recording, just, it just happened. So, all right, any questions with regards to display devices, various monitors, projectors, and the different technologies that are kind of out there at the moment? All right. After this technical session, you should be able to describe the different types of displays and their respective characteristics describe the purpose of projectors and the various things that we use to um, describe what they're able to do, their throw, their brightness, uh, how many lumens they have, things like that. We should be able to identify the video ports and connectors that are utilized to connect monitors and identify common problems with monitors and how to address them. Little hint, more often than not, it's in the cable. And we are done with that one.